All right, so once again, for those of you just coming in, I'm Amanda Wheeler with Applied Ballistics. Tonight's class um, was supposed to be Where the Wind Matters with Dan Perriard. Unfortunately, Dan had something come up at the last minute, so he is not going to be here for this class. Um, we are in the process of rescheduling it and everyone who already signed up for it will automatically get an invite when we do that. And I will keep you posted and send you an email and let you know about that. Um, but in the meantime, I asked Brian Litz if he would jump in tonight and talk ballistics and shooting and questions and answers and all those good things with you guys tonight. So with that, here's Brian Litz. Hello, everybody. Um, yeah, like Amanda said, I'm filling in for Dan this evening. Um, uh, it's a very interesting topic where the wind matters. Uh, we can certainly talk about that or anything else that you guys have questions about. I, To be honest, I didn't uh, prepare a lot of content to just deliver. I like more of a question and answer style dialogue. Um, but we can, you know, definitely start with where the wind matters. And, you know, I won't be able to cover some of the technical details such as the instrumentation that Dan and his group have experience with, um, you know, but I can talk as a competitor with experience and also a ballistician in terms of the technical side of um, where the wind influences your trajectory. Um, so I'll just jump right in. So where the wind matters, I think it's a very complicated question, but, um, you know, a good approach to complicated questions is to just slice it up and, uh, you know, to make it simpler, look in different realms. So if we consider three, uh, three regimes between you and the target, we'll call it the near wind, the mid-range wind, and the far wind near the target. And, you know, we'll talk about what's unique about each of those segments. Um, again, this is where, you know, Dan's modeling would have continuous, uh, you know, graphing of the effects all the way, but just for this purpose of conversation and for practical application, we can talk about these three zones, the near, mid, and far wind. Um, so which one matters the most on your trajectory? That's what everyone learning to read the wind wants to know is where do I pay the most attention to the wind? Um, and, you know, the near wind has, there's good reasons to pay attention to the wind that's near you. Um, one reason is that is definitely the only wind that you can measure with a handheld device like a Kestrel or you can feel it or you're very close to the indicator. So you're more likely to get an accurate read on the wind that's near you. So that's one argument to pay attention to that wind. Um, another reason why a uh, good argument for the wind near you having the most effect is that the, any deflection that occurs near the shooter, um, the bullet is the trajectory is basically going to inherit that and propagate that angle all the way to the target. So if it gets deflected in the first hundred yards and it's already on a skewed path, well, it's already you know on its way to being off target and it it carries that misalignment all the way. Um, so those you know a couple of good arguments for the near wind being the most influential on the trajectory. Um, the mid-range wind, you know, a good argument for that is that's where the bullet is near its apex of the trajectory. It's highest up in the air. Um, and if you know about wind gradient, where the wind down at the ground is moving slower than the wind aloft. Um, and because of that, the wind, you know, when your bullet's high in its trajectory, it's going to be it's in the, the highest like velocity wind. Yeah. 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 So then, you know, I, there, I think someone needs to mute. Someone needs I can't. to mute themselves, please. Okay. Yeah, I couldn't hear myself think for a minute. <laughs> um, so yeah, the, the mid-range wind could also be very influential or important to watch because that's where your bullet is the highest up in the air and exposed to maybe the highest speed of wind, especially if you're shooting over a canyon, for example, where the ground kind of falls away from your line of sight and your bullet finds itself maybe hundreds of feet above the ground way up in that high speed wind gradient, like, you know, across the canyon. Um, and then there's the wind near the target. Okay, some arguments for that is, you know, that's where your bullet is going the slowest. So it spends the most time in that last third. And so uh, that's, you know, also a good argument for why the wind would matter at the target. Um, and, you know, the real answer, like if you're looking for a, you know, is this multiple choice A, B or C, it's not that simple. Um, in the real world, when you're talking about something that's a 
fluid by nature like the wind? The answer is always that it depends. And that's the case here with the wind. It depends mostly on your terrain. Um, I mean, think about it. Some terrains, if you have a constant wind between you and the target, all three of those zones are the same. So it doesn't matter if you're watching it at you or the target or mid-range. If it's constant, uh, you get a good read on one and you have a good read on the whole thing. Other than that, the terrain is really going to dictate where the wind is most important. Um, I remember a time early in my competitive shooting career where, you know, I had internalized the, the, the textbook answer. Okay, if there's going to be a, a correct answer academically, um, the answer to the question where the wind matters the most is near the shooter. Um, and the reason being that that early deflection and the effect that it carries through its trajectory overwhelms the other considerations that, that I talked about. Um, but that is, that is the academic answer because it doesn't account for higher speed winds aloft, higher speed winds downrange. Um, you know, it's, there's a lot of shooting scenarios where the shooter might be shielded from any wind at all. So the wind is zero where he's at or near. But as soon as you clear the tree line or get out over the bluff, the bullet experiences a lot of wind. So um, in this particular experience, I was shooting a Midwest Palma match in Lodi, Wisconsin. And if you're familiar with that range, um, there's a, a ravine that goes across about 200 yards in front of the targets. So like uh, 800 yards in front of the shooter, it's a thousand yard range. And the flags are pretty easy to read down there. Well, I was under the impression that the wind near me mattered the most because I got just from reading the textbook. And so I was paying attention to the flags near myself and I was constantly surprised and disappointed by my wind reads not being accurate. Well, when I shift my focus to uh, the flags in that valley, because they my shots seem to correlate more to that, um, I started being able to read the wind a lot better on that range. And that's the key is that, you know, it's about the terrain and the local variations that you have through a certain terrain. Uh, so it happened at that range that most of the range is shielded by trees. You know, it's kind of like, a uh, corridor cut in, in the trees. And, but where your bullet is passing over that ravine, the tree line drops away and you, the highest speed wind on the range is through that ravine. So even though it was 800 yards from the shooter and only 200 yards from the target, um, and, and I experienced this year after year going there, that seems to be the most reliable wind indicator on the range. It goes counter to the textbook example, but in the real world, that's how it plays out on that range. So I guess the takeaway to this is, you know, not to, sorry, it's not an easy answer as in A, B, or C, um, but the takeaway is that it depends and there's no easy way around the time and experience that you have to put in to practice reading the wind um, and observing the cause effect relationship between your indicators and where your bullet hits. Okay. It's um, some types of shooting disciplines really lend themselves well to this sort of practice. Like um, sling shooting and F class, you know, you're shooting 20 rounds at the same target slow fire. And so, you know, you've got flags in Mirage. So you really have a lot of opportunities to, you know, observe that cause and effect and play with it and try this hold and try that hold. Um, other shooting disciplines that are more dynamic, like PRS or, you know, hunting scenarios where you get one or two shots at a target and then you shift. Well, you're either right or you're wrong on your wind call before you have to move on. You can still learn that way, uh, but it's not quite the, the clinic that you can get the reinforcement from shooting repetitively at the same distance at the same target all the time. Um, so that's, you know, that's one key to learning how to read the wind and where it matters most uh, through experience is engage in shooting disciplines that give you the opportunity to observe that cause effect relationship. Um, and, you know, so you, you pick a good discipline for that, um, or can help your training and help you be a better wind reader. And there's certain equipment items too, that will help you be a better wind reader. Um, a device like the Kestrel, for example, is, you know, a really good tool for learning to understand how fast the wind is blowing. You know, when I was really trying to move up the ranks in competition shooting, I had a Kestrel with me every time I was in the neighborhood walking the dog, every time I was just out in a, you know, in an open field environment where I'm looking at the indicators, feeling the wind and making a guess and then take a measurement. And after you guess and measure enough times that sort of educates your insight as to, all right, I thought that was an eight miles an hour wind, but it's really a 12 mile an hour wind. So 
after enough cycles of that, you your insight gets more and more accurate. Um, so the Kestrel is a really good tool. Um, another really good tool, believe it or not, is a scope level. And it, it may not be immediately obvious how a scope level is going to help you read wind, um, but it's pretty easy to to understand when you realize just how much of an effect a uh, rifle can't has on your uh, horizontal displacement that can look like wind deflection. All right, so to go uh, have a short conversation about rifle cant, a uh, level is also, they're called anti-cant devices. That's the whole purpose of having one so you don't uh, tilt the rifle left or right. And so what happens if you don't have a level or some way to reference what's horizontal and vertical, your human eye is only good to resolve plus or minus about three degrees of rotation or cant, which is pretty good. You know, it's, we evolved with that ability. It hasn't held us back. But when you're engaging targets at distance, um, you're dealing with an instrument that's very sensitive to cant. Now, to put three degrees in perspective, at a thousand yards with a typical trajectory, um, every degree of rifle cant is worth about five inches of lateral displacement left or right. So plus or minus three degrees, that's plus or minus 15 inches of center. That's a 30 inch wide group. Okay, so even if the wind is not even blowing, if you are just struggling with cant, you know, on every shot, you're canted a little left, a little right, within a plus or minus three degree window, you're already shooting a 30 inch wide group at a thousand yards. And if you're trying to correlate cause and effect of wind variables, it, it, there's too much static for that signal to come through, um, if that makes sense. You know, how, how can you know what's moving your bullet a half a minute when you're dealing with an uncertainty that is three minutes of angle wide? Um, so, and I've seen it a lot of times over the years, competitors will come to a match and, you know, they'll just be, they'll come off the line and be fuddled by the wind. They're like, man, I thought I was on it. And then all of a sudden this eight came out of nowhere, you know, clear at the edge of the target. And they're talking about how tricky the wind was. Well, anytime a shooter is talking about how tricky the wind was, and I don't think it's that tricky, most of the time it's because that shooter doesn't have a level on their scope that enables them to not suffer from the effects of cant. Because that's exactly what it looks like. If you think that windage is the reason why your target would be wide, why your group would be wide, and you see your group wide, that's what you're going to think it is. But in fact, cant is another reason your group could be wide um, you might not uh, understand or know about. Most everyone that's shot long range for any amount of time just understands how essential a level is. And honestly, it's one of the least expensive things that you can put on a long range gun, uh, but it's probably the most bang for the buck that there is. Um, so that was, you know, that was, that was a lot on where the wind matters, how to improve your wind reading. Um, I usually don't talk that long without taking questions or interacting. So um, if there have been questions coming in on the chat, Amanda, this would be a good time or if somebody's got a question about what I've explained just now. Okay, so Ed um, Boss was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the value of reading Mirage. Okay, so the value of reading Mirage is, is very location specific. Um, some conditions you just on some ranges and some terrains you just won't have mirage so first of all you can't rely on it 100 percent of the time uh, as a wind indicator um, but if you if you study enough mirage in enough different places it can be incredibly valuable um, you can use mirage to gauge the strength of the crosswind without doing the trig and what i mean by that is most of the time when you're assessing the wind condition, you've got to do the speed and direction, right? That's a 10 mile an hour from two o'clock. Well, it's only just a crosswind component of that two o'clock wind that, that really matters. So if you're doing it in your head, you've got to figure out, you know, that's like 70% of 10 miles an hour. Um, but the beauty of the Mirage, the part of where the Mirage is valuable in this application is that you only see the crosswind component of it. So if you have a one o'clock wind, you know, it's that mirage is not going to be crossing your line of sight as fast as the same speed wind from nine o'clock, if that makes sense. And so a good example, if you have a headwind or a tailwind, the mirage will present as a boil with no discernible direction in it. Okay. And so mirage is, it's very valuable for that. Uh, just giving you like, if you're looking straight at your target, 
any movement in the mirage that you see crossing your line of sight effectively is that's nature doing the trig for you and showing you only the crosswind component of whatever wind is blowing. Um, another thing that you can use Mirage for is to actually determine the wind direction. And the way you would do that is with usually a spotting scope because you can point that anywhere you want. You basically swivel your spotting scope around the range until you see a boil and that is the no wind condition or that is where the wind is coming from or going to. Uh, but there's no cross component when you see a boil in the mirage. So you can determine wind direction with mirage. You can determine the effective crosswind speed with mirage. Um, but it only is going to apply under certain conditions. And it takes a good amount of experience. And that experience, you, you can be leaps and bounds ahead if you attach yourself to someone who knows how to do this well. You know, trying to figure it out on your own, you can do it, but it'll take you a lot longer than if you can um, learn from someone who can explain what you're looking at and explain what it means, um, that's really the best way to learn Mirage uh, the quickest. Okay, so Evan is um, has a reloading question and he says that he's having inconsistent muzzle velocities. What has the biggest effect on lowering your SDs and getting my muzzle velocity consistent? Um, he's re reloading for a 300 Norma using Rotumbo with 230 grain burgers, burger OTMs, and Lapua brass. Okay. Um, I don't see what primer's on there. Primer could be very important. Um, 215Ms are the primers that we use for that very combination of components. Uh, yep, 215Ms. So a um, couple things come to mind. First of all, that is a combination that should produce good standard deviations. And so if it doesn't, then something, something is keeping it back. In other words, you're using all the right stuff. Um, there's just something wrong. And it doesn't have to be with the ammo. Your ammo might actually have SDs in the single digits. Um, a lot of times it's a chronograph that will lead shooters to think that their loads are not good when they really are better than they think. Um, Evan, what kind of chronograph are you measuring? Okay, lab radars are typically very good. If they're set up correctly, um, I wouldn't think you'd have a problem resolving SDs. Um, so another, let's see, another issue you could be having is uh, the state of your barrel. Um, you know, and this goes for anything, not just 300 normas in this condition, but we found that new barrels uh, with less than 200 rounds on them, it's it's nearly impossible to get standard deviations that are low. Um, yeah, so it's a new barrel, new from Barrett, is it an MRED? Yeah, okay, we have lots of experience with those. And so this, I'd be almost sure is the problem. If you got less than 200 rounds on that barrel, you're just not gonna see consistently low SDs, no matter what the load is, the barrel isn't able to do it. Um, now, this is, this goes down a rabbit hole, but I would say the high points are to develop a consistent cleaning method that involves abrasives every hundred rounds, abrasives like JB bore paste and do that every hundred rounds. And by, by the time you get 200 rounds on that barrel, um, you know, Rotumbo, look at around 80 to 82 grains of Rotumbo or no, 230s, look at around 78 to 80 grains of Rotumbo with that load. Um, I think 3.615 is what, what we load that to and maybe a little longer for the 230. And when that barrel's got over 200 rounds on it, if you've been cleaning with abrasives, you will see those SDs come down. Um, we have done a lot of life cycle testing on barrels from Barrett and MRADs with those very components, except mostly 215s, not 230s. Um, but there, there's no difference as far as the SDs go. And when I say life cycle testing, we run barrels through an entire, like a thousand rounds, clean it every hundred rounds and just shoot. And we shoot the same ammo from beginning to end, never changing the load because we're studying the barrel more so than the load. And what, you know, we chart every single group is tracked with the radar and grouped on paper. And we can watch the consistency of muzzle velocities improve and get better and better 
until at 200 rounds and more. I say 200 rounds is a, you know, after a hundred rounds, you'll start getting some groups with low SDs. Maybe one shot will be out, usually the first shot. But by the time you've got 200 rounds on it, you're going to start shooting groups with uh, really low SDs and you don't have to change anything about your components. Um, unfortunately, I think that's a theme that a lot of hand loaders suffer from is they'll get a new barrel and start trying to work up a load and their SDs are not good. And so they keep trying and trying everything under the sun, every primer, every powder, moving to bullets that they wouldn't otherwise shoot. And lo and behold, about the time the barrel has got 200 rounds on it, everything starts shooting good. And the shooter may have dismissed a lot of loads that were good during the time that the barrel wasn't ready to shoot yet. Um, so let's see what else. I'm reading 3.3. Okay, yeah, that's a that's a really 90 grains is a really high load. Um, yeah, I wouldn't go that high with Rotumbo with 230s in that. Uh, but I still don't think that's your problem. I think it's just that it's a new barrel. Um, a 338 Lapua in Emirate, I don't know. Uh, we don't have as much experience with 338 Lapua, and we've done a lot of 300 Norma. But I would suspect that it, we have seen it in other cartridges, 6.5 Creedmoor, 300 Norma, uh, 375 enabler are the three cartridges that we have done the most life cycle testing on. And every one of them showed the same thing at about 200 rounds is where the SDs got to be the best. And they stayed that way for the life of the barrel. Um, six, five Creedmoor, the effect was minimal, but it still showed an improvement at 200 rounds. Um, 300 Norma and 375 enabler were there's a dramatic improvement in SDs at around 200, 200 rounds. Um, so that's what I would say is don't worry about your hand loading. I don't think you're doing anything wrong. I think you're using good equipment. Uh, just give that barrel a chance to break in. Okay. Carlton, um, says he's asking to, for us to discuss the impact of temperature. Carlton, if you want to come off of mute, are you talking temperature, um, of what, of the, like, the day like it's 90 degrees versus yes. shooting okay yes <clears throat> so go ahead and, and explain what you're trying to ask yeah are you looking at temperature effect on ammo or on the bullet in flight uh both okay so temperature effect on ammo the principle is pretty straightforward that um Powders burn faster and hotter according to their initial temperature. Um, some are a lot more stable than others. There's, there's some powders that hardly change velocity at all in the heat and other powders that change dramatically. Um, to give it some perspective, when I say change hardly at all, like some of the best powders we've seen, they change velocity about uh, 0.1 feet per second per degree. That means over 100 degrees, your ammo is only speeding up 10 feet per second. Okay. On the more, on the higher end of the extreme, we've uh, tested powders that were over one foot per second per degree. So let's say if it was 1.2 feet per second per degree, um, you're over a hundred degree span of temperature, your velocity is changing 120 feet per second. Um, that's pretty drastic. Um, it doesn't mean that it's a bad powder or that you can't use it. It just means that you've got a bit of a chore in monitoring what the exact temperature of your ammo is whenever you go to shoot so that you can accurately predict your muzzle velocity. Okay, we talk about ballistic solvers and garbage in, garbage out. All of your inputs have to be correct. Well, muzzle velocity, if you're using a, a powder that's not very temperature stable, then muzzle velocity gets to be a very important input that can be difficult to nail down due to the temperature. And sort of uh, something that makes it even more difficult is you might be able to measure the air temperature with good accuracy with the Kestrel, things meant to measure the air temperature, but the temperature of your powder inside the case is always going to lag the air temperature, or if it's in your car, it might be hotter than the outside air. So guessing what the temperature of your powder is can get to be a game of itself. So um, yeah, temperature can affect powder and that can change your muzzle velocity. And the best way to go about testing that is to basically heat soak some rounds and cold soak some rounds and leave some at ambient. 
and then shoot all three and see what velocities you get at the different temperature conditioned powder. And then you will have a, at least a starting point to know, you know, at any temperature, what velocity you can expect. Um, so that's temperature effect on ammo. Temperature effect on the bullet in flight. Uh, there's two major effects that temperature has on the bullet in flight. And they both have to do with the air. Um, one of them is just the obvious effect that temperature has on air density. So hotter air is thinner, less dense than colder air. That's why hotter air rises. So because it's less dense, it's easier for the bullet to fly through and your bullet has less drag, gets the target sooner, has less drop, less wind drift. All things, all ballistic performance measures are improved when the temperature is higher um, through reducing the effects of reducing air density. It's like going up in altitude has the same effect. Um, but temperature has another effect on the air that is more subtle um, and really only affects you much around transonic. And what I'm referring to is the temperature's effect on the speed of sound. So the speed of sound through the air in standard conditions is uh 1116 feet per second and but that changes depending on the temperature so if the temperature changes and the speed of sound changes that means the mach number of your bullet changes and as the mach number of your bullet changes the drag coefficient changes so you know even once you've taken into account the air density impact of temperature um this and this is all done in the ballistic solver by the way so don't think you've got to do any of this. Uh, this is all done behind the scenes. If you input the correct temperature, then our ballistic solver applies the effect to air density. And it also applies the shift to the speed of sound and the Mach number and the drag of your bullet. So um, the biggest thing that you have to manage personally that's in your hands is understanding how the temperature affects your muzzle velocity uh, that you input into the program. Um, muzzle velocity is a big deal towards getting an accurate solution and temperature can really mess with that through, um, you know, through your ammos, your powder sensitivity, but everything related to the bullets flight is managed in the software. Okay, there is a question about, sorry, uh, please explain yaw of repose and Mangus effect. Yeah, of repose and Magnus effect. Yep. Um, okay, so I'll do Magnus effect first because it's uh, had, it's one of the most asked about but least relevant. So we can put that to bed pretty quick. Um, Magnus effect is the force that arises when uh, fluid flows over a body that's spinning. Okay, it's how curveballs curve. You throw a ball that's spun, and half of that ball is like moving towards the batter. So the airflow over that side is faster, and the, the airflow around the other side, the side of the ball that's rotating back towards the pitcher, is moving slower in relation to the oncoming air. So that causes a pressure differential that applies a force and causes a thing to move. Same reason golf balls slice. Um, it's, it's the force that's generated by air moving over a spinning body. Now you say, well, bullets are spinning bodies. How's that not relevant? Well, the thing is that you need, in order to generate a Magnus force and a subsequent Magnus moment, the torque, um, you need the airflow to be going, um, like to be blowing over the body. The deal with a bullet is it's always pointing its nose straight into the oncoming airflow. So there is no cross flow over the spinning body of the bullet. Um, there shouldn't be. If you have a bullet that's unstable, that's flying sideways or something, well then yeah, you're gonna get Magnus forces and that's part of what disperses unstable bullets. But for bullets that are well behaved and flying like they should, Magnus effect is not, uh, is not really at play. It's not really doing much. Um, so yaw of repose, on the other hand, is something that is a lot more common and a lot more relevant. Was it was it yaw of repose he asked about, or was it um, limit cycle yaw? yaw? Yaw of repose. Yep. yep, sorry. Okay, so yaw of repose, that is related to, that's what causes spin drift, basically. So, um, 
so when the bullet comes out of the barrel and it's flying, suppose there's no wind, it's going to fly straight out along the barrel's axis. Uh, as soon as it's released from the muzzle, gravity acts on it and starts pulling the trajectory down away from the bore line. And as that happens, what you're introducing is a sort of the wind is kind of coming up, the airflow is coming up under the bullet's chin and causing the bullet to realign its axis with the oncoming airflow. And that oncoming airflow is ever bending with the trajectory. So the bullet has got to constantly realign its axis. Well, anytime that you force a spinning mass to realign its axis, uh, weird stuff happens. Like imagine a top on a table. There's a lot of things the top analogy doesn't work for, but this one should make the point. So if you have a top on the table that's not spinning, let's just say it's just perfectly balanced and you push the stem, it just falls away from you naturally. But if it's spinning and you push on the stem, it doesn't just fall away from you, it corrects itself um, and it goes through a series of precession cycles and ends up in a different place. Um, and that's kind of what the yaw of repose is. That's how it arises, is that the bullet is spinning and as it bends and traces through its trajectory, the axis of the bullet is, got, is forced to rotate. And in response to that forced rotation, the bullet undergoes a series of very tiny precession cycles, much like the top, and it ends up pointing off axis in the direction of the spin rate. So to the right for right twists and to the left for left twists. So that's all the mechanism of it. But the basic definition is that the yaw of repose is the small lateral angle that the bullet makes in relation to the bore line um, that steers the bullet off its course and results in spin drift. And it's to the right for right twist and to the left for left twist. The angle itself is very small. We're talking like 0 0.02 degrees point. Like it would be very difficult to measure if you like shot a, you know, a hole in the paper and you're like, I don't see any angle. Well, it's only enough to steer the bullet five or six inches at a thousand yards. So it is a very tiny steering effect, uh, but it is non-zero. So that's Yaw of Repose and Magnus. Okay, um, so Ed Ben asks, does anyone use vertical wind profiles effectively? Uh, does anyone use them effectively? <laughs> I know some people that try to use them. I don't know how effective they are. Um, so I, I'm not sure I know how to answer that. Uh, vertical wind is, has the same effect as horizontal wind. Uh, the bullet doesn't really care what direction the wind's coming from. It, it reacts the same way. Um, the thing is that on planet Earth, you don't get much vertical wind through lines of sight. Okay, we're shooting from one place to another on the surface of the planet. And so the idea of the wind blowing up through or down through your line of sight, it's not impossible. Like you could be shooting from, you know, between canyons. And so there's a lot of room for that to develop, but you usually only get uh, vertical winds over a short portion of the trajectory, like at the edge of the canyon wall, or uh, usually it's not pervasive for the whole uh, trajectory. Um, and it would be very difficult to instrument and measure as to what the vertical wind field is. And so. No, I'm talking, about, I'm talking about the vertical variation of crosswind. So crosswind gets higher as you move up in, in the, in the you know, vertically. Oh, okay. Yeah, so, you're talking about uh, wind gradient. Okay. Yeah, so yeah, I mentioned that earlier and where the wind matters. So yeah, at, so we, everybody has experience with this and you'll understand if we exaggerate it. So in any wind environment, if you get low enough, if you get all the way flat on the ground beneath the grass, the wind is not blowing down there. Okay, air might be moving, but the wind isn't blowing. You get a foot above the ground and let's say from a prone firing position, the shooter can maybe feel some wind on his face that's very different from the wind you feel in your face when you stand up. And that's only the difference of, you know, several feet. But when the bullet is, you know, 20, 30, 100 feet aloft, it can get into some much more serious airflow up there. And to answer your question, does anyone use that? Um, it's, 
it's one of those things that is so terrain and condition dependent that it's you can't generalize it. Like you can't build that into a ballistics program um, and have it work the same in different terrains. Um, you, I think you would have to have instrumentation to determine the wind gradient and then you could turn around and model it. But um, no, I can't say that I know anyone that, that uses that directly from instrumentation. There's um, practical experience and adjustments that are made. For example, when we shoot ELR, you know, our bullets are hundreds of feet in the air on their way to, you know, a two mile target. And for example, if we, if we know we can read the wind at our location and we can see the target. And even if we nail that wind speed and direction hundred percent, correct, we still add 20 or 30% to the wind call to account for the fact that the bullet is spending most of its time hundreds of feet above where our indicators are. So I suppose in that context, we do use knowledge of wind gradient to correct our fire solutions. Okay. Hey, Susan is wondering if you can um, give a little breakdown on how you think it's best to break in a barrel, i.e. shoot X number of rounds, clean, shoot X number of rounds, clean, so on, so on. Um. Yeah, that's a good question. There's a lot of opinions about that, and I won't say any of them are wrong. Um, I can tell you what we do and what we observe. Um, what we do is we'll start out shooting, we'll put five or 10 rounds on a new barrel and give it a full abrasive cleaning and then proceed to shoot 100 rounds. And our cleaning interval is pretty strictly 100 rounds, whether it needs it or not. You know, it's hard to know what the effects are on a barrel that needs cleaned. It's, I don't think it's as simple as when the groups open up. Some guns may be that way. Um, we clean them every hundred rounds sort of out of maintenance. You know, you don't wait till your engine breaks down to change the oil. You do it at a specified interval to get the most out of most life out of your engine. And that's how we think of cleaning is you just, whether it needs it or not, you clean it. And when the barrel is new, you're probably cleaning more often than you might have to. When the barrel is old, 100 rounds, it may be that you need to clean every 80 rounds when the barrel is late in its life. Uh, but just as a rule of thumb, we clean every 100 rounds and we don't really do anything special about break-in. Um, now, I would say that comes from a place of dealing with, you know, custom barrels. Most of them are already polished and very smooth from the manufacturer. Um, if I was dealing with more factory barrels, you know, that are made in production style very fast, they're, they're often very rough and have a lot of tooling marks in them. If I were to deal with barrels like that, I would definitely make something like a fire lapping process, part of the break-in, uh, just to smooth it out. I've, I've seen the fire lapping process work um, really well, but it doesn't make a difference if you're starting with a barrel that's already smooth. You know what I mean? The point of it is to smooth the barrel. If it's smooth to begin with, you're not doing anything, but a rough barrel, I would definitely fire lap um, to smooth it out, to break it in. But if you're dealing like, again, the high quality custom barrels that you get from any of the manufacturers, in my opinion, they don't need much break in. They just need regular good cleaning. Um, Greg says, okay, here's his question. Which data object in the AB solvers or applications do I get to see the maximum height of the bullet's trajectory? Meaning which field will tell me what height over the shooting platform the bullet is traveling? Um, that depends on what device you're using. For example, in the Kestrel, I know that there's, if you go into ballistics, it'll tell you what the max ord is. And that's, um, that's the answer to that. But in, regardless of what tool you're using, if you can print a range card, um, you can always figure that out. Let's say, suppose your target's at 1,000 yards and you put your zero at 1,000 yards, okay? Then you look at your table, your range card, and you'll see that your bullet is, you know, you'll basically be able to trace out the arc of it. And you just go down the table and look for the highest number. And that's, that's the highest that your bullet gets. So you can find your max ord with any ballistics program that gives you a table if you set your zero range at the target. Okay, and Brandon is wondering, um, has Applied Ballistics Lab ever experimented 
with optimum barrel time with reloading with quick loads? No, I'm aware of that. Um, I'm aware of that theory. Um, we haven't, in our lab, I think, a, I think it's a common misunderstanding that we do a lot of precision work at the lab, meaning trying to shoot small groups. And that's what the barrel timing thing is all about. And although we're definitely interested in precision and we document it and make records, that we're not up there trying to shoot bench rest bug hole groups every day. Um, and so deep diving into those aspects of, you know, uh, optimal barrel time or harmonics and tuning is, that's not something that we do. We're measuring bullets in flight. Um, we're measuring, you know, getting radar tracks. We are studying what it takes to make consistent ammunition. Um, and other, you know, even when, you know, developing a competition gun for F-class or ELR, uh, and we're looking for precision, we approach precision as a, you know, how's the gun assembled and how are you shooting it? Meaning, does it like the bipod you're using? Does it like the rear bag? Does it like your position? And you basically first order effects. I think there's a long list of first order effects that affect precision a lot more than uh, barrel harmonics or optimal barrel timing, which I would consider a second or third order effect. So, and it, it, I would say we've achieved really good precision uh, without ever considering those, those types of things. Not to say that it isn't valid, just to answer your question, no, we haven't looked closely at it. Great, and Evan's wondering um, about what cleaning things we recommend, what we use out at the lab. So again, this is just how we do it. There's, uh, there's probably other ways to go about it, but the, the two categories of cleaning as I would look at it is you have your chemical solvents and you have your abrasives. Solvents are things like sweets, Montana Extreme, uh, Bortec, you know, the things that will dissolve the copper and carbon. Um, we don't use those so much. Um, we use the abrasives that basically rubs out or polishes out the fouling from the barrel. And the reasoning is the polishing seems to both remove the fouling and leave the fire cracking and other sharp edges. You're smoothing the barrel out in addition to removing the fouling. And the barrel seems to respond better to that over time and has a measurable effect on setting back your muzzle velocity if it's migrating too high. Um, whereas the chemical cleaning, yeah, you can see before and after with a bore scope that there was fouling and now there's not, but it doesn't seem to change the uh, change the precision or doesn't seem to affect the muzzle velocity migration that that barrel's encountering. And so we've just seen a lot more positive effects from cleaning barrels with abrasives than with chemicals. And it, it does not seem to have, an, a lot of people are afraid to go to abrasives because they think it'll wear the barrel out. Well, I mean, you want to wear the fouling out of it. That's, that's kind of what our goal is, is to um, abrade that out. And I, I don't know, you know, we've run abrasives really, really hard. And I can't say that we've ever really overdone it. So I'm not, I guess I'm not as afraid to, to use abrasives and, and it's quick and easy process. You know, we'll um, put JB on a tight fitting patch and run that for 30 strokes and then get a fresh patch, smear some more JB on it and repeat that 30 more strokes and then just flush it out at that point. Just, you know, we use brake cleaner sometimes just spray it in there or, you know, you can run a few patches of Croil or whatever just to get the JB out. But then it's just a matter of, you know, cleaning the bolt and everything, put it back together and, and you're good. Um, that's, that's our standard cleaning process. So we were talking about this in the office uh, the other day. Uh, what's 30? Down and back? Yeah, down and one? back is one. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, so, oh, I keep, keeps pushing you away. Sorry. Um, all right. Evan says, what FPS are you getting out of 300 Norma at 80 grains? And are you using this load for ELR? Um, with what, with what bullet? Evan was two thirties, right? From the beginning. Um, yeah. Th 
we've actually, most of our work is with 215s and 245s in 300 Norma. 230s are great in it too. Um, and honestly, I couldn't, I couldn't tell you a number off the top of my head. Our, you know, your MRED probably the same 26 inch barrel as ours, 80 grains. I would, I would estimate high 28, mid to high 2,800 feet a second with 80 grains in a 26 inch barrel. Okay, so Greg has a good question. He's wondering if we can share any knowledge that correlates primer seeding depth to ESSDs. Um, we've, we've tried all the primer games. Like I said, a lot of what we do in the lab is trying to um, create, I guess, recipes and processes for making very consistent ammunition. And so we have studied primer seeding depth uh, primer pocket uniformity, flash hole uniformity, deburring the inside of the flash holes, like everything that, that um, you know, shooters do to try to improve consistency in that way. And we have not found any correlation to any of that stuff. Um, the, the way that I've come out, my current opinion is you either have a good ignition system or you don't. And when I say ignition system, I just mean that combination of a primer and powder that ignites well. Um, your primer isn't too hot or too mild for the powder charge in the case volume, and your powder isn't too fast or too slow for the primer that you're using. Um, and so if, if you've matched those things properly, if, you, if they're a good match, then nothing you do to the case as far as the primer pocket, um, or the seating depth matters, um, unless I suppose there's always there's always scenarios. You know, if you had a gun that had a, you know, suppose the firing pin protrusion was not as as long as it should be, then you might suffer from seating a primer too deep because you're not hitting as good. But basically, you'd have to have a problem somewhere for a good ignition system not to give you low SDs. Okay, um, if I accidentally skipped your question, um, call me out in the chat. We're gonna go for another five minutes or so and then we're gonna wrap things up for the evening. Um, but I do have a question here. Do we, every time you guys type out, ah, do you recommend pointing bullets and trimming? Um, that's a big, it depends. Um, so the, the big reason you would trim bullets is to create uniformity. Okay, that's the only benefit that it has. It lowers BC, but it makes it more consistent. And so if you have bullets that, are, that have very inconsistent meeplets, then you would benefit a lot from trimming them. Um, but if, you, if you're using quality consistent bullets that have very consistent meeplets, then you're not gonna gain anything from trimming them. So that's, that's what trimming depends on is how uniform are your bullets to begin with. Um, and then pointing bullets, um, pointing has two, it does two things. One, it makes the bullets more uniform and it also increases the BC slightly. We're talking, you know, two to 4%, which that's actually, you know, 4% is actually quite a boost. It's pretty easy to get just from pointing. So even if you have uniform bullets, you could benefit by increasing the BC through pointing. Um, and if you had uh, bullets that were not uniform, then pointing them would make them more uniform and a little higher BC. And that BC uniformity that you get from trimming and pointing is important at long distance. Uh, that's going to determine how well your group stays together vertically. If you're Shots are very inconsistent in BC from shot to shot. Your group will spread out just like having a bad SD and muzzle velocity. Okay. Um, in calibers like 308 and 65 Creed, where you can um, use a small rifle or a large rifle primer, are we have we done any testing on that to see if there's a difference? Yep. Um, so in 308, 
I shot a lot of 308 in Palma and F class, everything from 155s to 215s. And I did not notice any benefit in SDs for the small rifle primers. Um, but what you do get is a more robust case head. Uh, a lot of times you fire brass a number of times and what well, you know, what wears it out is the, the primer pocket loosens under pressure. So you may only get three or four firings, but the small rifle primer brass, um, it, there's a lot more brass there. It'll hold a primer, the brass lasts longer. So that's the benefit there. Um, in 6.5 Creedmoor, we did some development and found that the small rifle primers were a lot better whenever you're using faster burning powders, as in uh, lighter bullets or shorter barrels is whenever you would want a faster burning powder. And the small primers do a lot better with that faster burning powder combination. What you don't want is the small primer with a slow burning powder or a large primer with a slow burning, uh, fast burning powder. So again, it's about matching that ignition system. If you get it, if you, if you have a, a need to run a fast burning powder, that is probably what's going to determine whether you should have a small or large primer. Um, also, you know, also considering what I mentioned with the 308 is, you know, how long you want your brass to last and how much pressure you're loading to. So everything is, it depends. That's the answer to nearly every question. Um, all right, Carlton wants to know if you can talk a little bit about neck tension. Um, neck tension, that's again, something that we have not found to have a big effect on either groups or SDs, um, you know, some competitors try the really light neck tension approach and soft seating the bullets into the case neck. So when you close the bolt, you're actually pushing the bullet back a little that guarantees that the bullets in the same place as your throat wears. Um, the downside, and you know, if you're shooting in certain types of competition, you could probably get away with that, but it makes your ammo not very robust. You know, it's kind of fragile. I've known shooters that have gone to matches with ammo like that and driven across a few states and they get there, they open their ammo box and like half the bullets have fallen down in the cases. Um, also, if you chamber around and then try to unload it, those bullets often can stick in the throat and you get powder everywhere and your gun is down and it's a big problem. Um, so I don't think that there's ever a reason that you would have to uh, see it with such light neck tension. And so I would, you know, I would recommend using, you know, a good amount, three or four thousandths of neck tension, hold the bullet in place so that your ammo is reliable, so that it's not fragile. I don't think that you'd ever find a genuine result where the gun just doesn't shoot groups unless you have light neck tension. You know, we've, we've gotten lots of guns to shoot really good and haven't deliberately loaded that light of neck tension in a lot of years. Okay, I'm gonna roll this next question, two questions into kind of one question. Um, so ELR and suppressors versus shooting not suppressed, do you notice any advantages or disadvantages to one or the other? And how then can you roll that into talking a little bit about muzzle brakes and how they affect the bullet flight? Yep, so... Um... Muzzle brakes are virtually a necessity for the large calibers we shoot in ELR just to manage recoil. Um, the problem is the concussion, right? It's downright damaging. The levels of concussion, I don't think people realize how serious um, you can sustain legitimate brain injury from being exposed to that kind of concussion for long enough, uh, enough times. Um, and so suppressors are, are really nice to have. The, the practical benefits that you get from a suppressor is obviously the concussion is gone. You can run, you know, maybe just one set of ear pro instead of double ear pro. That lets you communicate with your spotter better. Um, you're not blowing dust and dirt and grass all over your ammo and your, your gun every time you fire a shot. Um, that's, that's nice. You know, uh, there is a bit more recoil with suppressors as opposed to just brakes. So that's one practical downside. And some suppressors can take a while to get to know. When I, when I say get to know them, I mean, you know, sometimes the first shot is just going to be low or it's just going to be fast. Or, you know, you, you have some characteristics that get 
introduced when you add a new component like that. Um, some suppressors seem to run with no like on or off, the gun shoots the same, um, but you wanna find one that has minimal characteristics that you have to get to know and your gun will still shoot good groups and then you can benefit from, um, it really is a night and day difference shooting an ELR gun with and without a suppressor. It's, you know, you just learn to deal with the concussion and it becomes part of it. But once you shoot, Brent, Brian, we can't hear you now that your headphones. Can you um, maybe do your? Oh, I'm not sure. You have to. Am there I still go. coming through? Now you are. I can't. I can't hear you. Okay, you're good. You can hear me. Okay. You'll have to type the questions then because I can't hear you. Um, okay, I see a question here about, uh, do, would you say that practicing wind reading for 22 PRS ELR uh, is directly transferable? If you practice with the 22, does it translate directly to larger calibers over long distances? Um, actually, there's a lot that's different. I would not say that there that there's very much you could use that would be the same. I mean, you still are going to be reading Mirage. You're still going to be using a Kestrel. You're still going to be maybe looking at flags. But what that translates into is very different when the bullet is traversing two miles as opposed to 200 yards um, over short distances like you know two or three hundred yards. There's a lot of local effects, a lot of little microclimates and eddies and swirls that the bullet will go through. And that is a challenge for the 22 shooting that's at, at those short ranges where you're dealing with the microclimates within maybe there's trees or buildings around. Um, but in ELR shooting where, you know, you're basically shooting from one point to another on a weather map and there's high pressure here and low pressure there. So your bullet still goes through some local micro conditions, but it really evens out in the long run over, you know, a seven or eight second time of flight. So I would say it, it, some skills that are transferable are the ability to put a number on the mirage and, or a flag and the different ways that you will determine the wind speed and direction. But the way that that affects your trajectory is very different over two miles as compared to 200 yards. Okay. So that was a, a great question to okay. wrap this up. Let me see if I can find another question. Um, do I recommend neck turning brass? I do not. Um, I don't, I think that back in the bad old days, whenever, you know, components were, you know, made on equipment that was World War II kind of equipment, and it was so bad that you may have been able to improve it uh, with neck turning. But these days, even the inexpensive brands, um, it's 2021 now. Um, there, I don't think there's many brass drawing operations in the world that are not making brass good enough to shoot in precision rifles without having to turn it. Um, so that's, that's my recommendation on turning. Yeah, I'm scrolling up. I don't see any questions that we haven't got to. Um, looks like Amanda says we're going to wrap it up. Um, okay, so if you do have a question that we didn't get to um, or we missed in any way, feel free to email me anytime. Um, it's amanda.wheeler at appliedballisticsllc.com. And like I said, um, when I can get rescheduled with Dan, all of you will be invited back to Where the Wind Matters. Um, Brian, thank you so much for jumping in and doing this for us last minute. I appreciate everyone. Have a great evening. Good night.